We feel that race is so tangible, right? We feel that we know who we are, but try and define it, you know? Show me a good definition of what it is that is not a social definition, a biological definition. It's impossible. It's like trying to grab something and make it real, desperately trying to make it real because it has meaning, real meaning in the real world. And I think it's what scientists are most guilty of. I'm Angela Saini, I'm a science journalist and I've just published my third book, Superior, The Return of Race Science, looking at the kind of subtle return of race within mainstream science. Sure to be controversial, interesting. Mm -hmm. Where did the idea come from and how did you start to research the topic? I grew up in South East London at a time when it was a pretty racist place right. to be growing up. Um, and Stephen Lawrence was killed not very far from where I lived. I went to school in the same town as the BNP, the old BNP bookshop. So it really was kind of the backdrop to my teenage years and it never went away. I was a campaigner for anti-racism when I was at university mm -hmm. and however much you know we have our own interests and my interest was always science and engineering and we want to pursue them cleanly and not be bothered by politics. The politics is always there, it's part of our lives and um, one of the reasons I wanted to become a journalist is to talk about these things, explore these things and understand why people believe the things that they do. And what did you find in your research? Can you try and summarise it? What did you find surprising? Well, some of it is unsurprising <laughs> in that, of course, there is racism uh, within the scientific community because scientists are humans just like anybody else. And mm. race itself was invented and perpetuated as an idea by Enlightenment scientists. And then right throughout the 19th century, this idea of a racial hierarchy never went away. Mainstream scientists believed it. It was completely uncontroversial in Europe mm -hmm. to believe that there was a racial hierarchy. So science really did cement these ideas, make them feel more tangible mm. and real than they ever were. What fascinated me most, and what I spend a lot of the book looking at, is um, what happened after the Second World War. So okay. we know that before the Second World War, these ideas were very popular. Eugenics mm -hmm. and race science mm -hmm. was quite mainstream. But then once the Second World War happened and the Holocaust and Nazi racial hygiene, the world turned its back on this breed of science. Did it go away? Mm. So that's the big question that I really want to look at. And what I argue is that it didn't go away. Um, both that there was a strain of scientific racism, so people who came out of that kind of Nazi racial hygiene mm -hmm. tradition, eugenesis, who continued doing what they were doing. You know, the world didn't free itself of racism when the Second World War ended. Sure. There was still segregation, there was still apartheid, there was still colonialism. There was mm. all these things, these racial, racialized ideas yeah. about who we are still existed and they still exist now. And science to some extent reflects that and we okay. need to understand why. The argument that you put forward that race science never really went away even after the Second World War, even though we might like to think that it did. Mm. Has that proved controversial? I don't know if it is particularly controversial because I think many social scientists have made this argument and it's very difficult to look at the language and the frameworks that scientists still use, geneticists, medical researchers particularly, and be convinced that we are free of race because they invoke race all the time. They may not call it race, they may call them population groups, they may talk about you know statistical differences between these populations, but the frameworks are the same, they're still grouping people, and that idea, the idea of grouping people and treating these groups as distinct really is uh, a legacy of race science, you know, that's where it came from. Do you expect there to be much pushback from people perhaps working in the field? What do you expect the reaction to be? I don't go as far as some people in criticising individual scientists. There are some scientists, obviously, historically, who have been more guilty of scientific racism than others. For example, one of the characters I look at in the book is Otmar van Verschuur, who was a Nazi race scientist. He did experiments on the bodies of children murdered in Auschwitz, you know, it's very difficult there to have any moral neutrality. <laughs> that is obviously the worst kind of race science. But we all invoke race in our everyday lives. We all use these categories as social categories, obviously, by and large, but also sometimes we can't help 
treading into biological territory at the same time of generalizing, stereotyping, assuming that there is something innate that makes people who they are. The point I'm trying to make is that we all use race. Why do we use it? What do we think it means? And how do we move beyond that? I'd like to talk about one of the recent occasions in which these issues uh, with population genetics and race science came into um, the mainstream media. There was a paper in um, the New York Times written by David Reich uh, in 2018. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about what your reaction was to that paper and why it proved so controversial? He thinks that while many of the racial categories that we use are completely meaningless, they have very little genetic validity. For example, in America, um, Hispanic, you know, mm. this is a group of people with such a broad range of ancestries from African to European to uh, Native American, you know, there is no ancestral unity in that category of Hispanic. But he said at the same time, black Americans and white Americans have uh, source populations that are divided by 70,000 years of history. Couldn't there be some evolutionary consequences to that? Not that he knows what they are, but that why can we not ask that question, you know? Is it meaningful? And of course, this uh, reflects the racial politics of the US, right? People think about this all the time. It's a hugely racialized society. So for me personally, we have to be very careful before we start invoking these categories. And as scientists, for scientists to start saying, you know, what's the harm in asking these questions? Mm -hmm. We need to be, ask, be asking these questions. Well, we need to be careful because these questions have huge political ramifications. And even the suggestion that there might be differences, some kind of deeper cognitive or psychological mm. differences, for instance, has huge political weight attached to it because of the enormous racism of American society historically. We know that there are huge gaps um, in life expectancy, in incarceration rates, in school achievement, in college achievement between black Americans, white Americans. And we know there are huge um, social and cultural environmental explanations for why these exist. To start invoking genetics before we have a grip on all of those explanations, before we know the extent of those explanations, I think is slightly reckless because it plays into the racism of the past. We have to remember that there are scientific racists, there are race scientists, people on the margins of science who aren't respected, um, who use this kind of free speech, academic freedom argument to make racial speculation, which, which can be very dangerous. What do you think the risks might be if we do continue down this road and don't ask questions, legitimate questions about mm. race science and population genetics. Mm. What might the implications be for geneticists and people working within the field and trying to conduct research? We have to remember that population geneticists for a long time have already been looking at human variation. They have a huge amount of data. One of the reasons that they do this is because we're politically so interested in it. So we do have a huge amount of research. We have to also remember that social scientists have done a huge amount of research into racial gaps. And when I say racial gaps, I mean gaps arising from discrimination, from the way that society treats people differently. Um, but second, we have to ask ourselves, is it a legitimate question? Is it fair for a scientist to say, uh, in the spirit of inquiry, I should be able to ask whether black people and white people have cognitive differences between them? Now we know um, and we've known this for quite a long time, that there is very little biological meaning to the categories white and black. They encompass a huge range of people with a huge amount of difference between them. We know that the majority of human variation, the vast majority, you know, more than 90%, lies within so-called uh, so racial groups or population groups. So that is the source of the majority of variation that we can see. So what kind of answers do you expect to get given that those two conditions that you have? Is it really a meaningful and legitimate question? And there are many geneticists um, who say it isn't. Mark Thomas, for instance, at UCL, who I also interviewed, um, just thinks it's nonsense. You know, there's no need to group people. Mark Jobling at the University of Leicester, who I also interviewed, said that 
there's no, you know, grouping is quite arbitrary. It always has been quite arbitrary. From the beginning, it was. You know, there were race scientists early on who divided the world into black, yellow, um, brown, white, and that was their, <laughs> those were their definitions. And to some extent, that's what we still live with. You know, we still use the word Caucasian as though it has some, it feels scientific, you know, Caucasian. It feels better than white. It has even less biological meaning than any other racial group we use. So I'm Caucasian to some, I'm brown to others, politically I'm black to others. What, you know, what do these categories really mean at the end of the day? Um, and the fact is that the reason that we can't pin it down, the reason that we don't know where the boundaries lie is because there were never were any boundaries there in the first place. So to suggest that we can ask a meaningful question about something that was quite arbitrary to begin with, I think is the most problematic thing at all. Are there any ways that you came across perhaps in your research of mitigating the risks that you're talking about or maybe asking some questions which there is a consensus are legitimate to ask and framing them in a better and more enlightening way? I think to some extent that's already been done by social scientists and the approach that social scientists have taken, you know, anthropologists before the Second World War and many social scientists after the Second World War is we know that people are treated differently as a result of the racial categories that we use, the socially defined racial categories that we use. And there is a huge amount of research, particularly in societies like the UK and the US, which are multicultural, where race matters. We have a lot of data. We do have, those questions are being asked. They're asked, being asked in really important and useful, tangible ways. What I would like to see, perhaps, is biology, biologists, engage with that body of work a lot more and inform for that to inform the questions that they then ask because these aren't um, unrelated things it's not possible for a medical researcher for example to look at the high rates of asthma among black americans and assume that that must be innate or some product of biology when there's a huge amount of data there explaining why the social conditions of black Americans lead to higher rates of asthma. What are the take home messages that you hope people will embrace <laughs> and digest? Well, I wrote this book for everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean, we all have some commitment to the idea of race. We still, we all think about race to some extent, not always in negative ways, sometimes in positive ways. We value our racial heritage, you know, our ethnic heritages, our cultural diversity. We have to be careful about when we conflate those with biological ideas about who we are. However much research has undermined the idea of race, it's also not let go of the idea at the same time. Population geneticists who, after the Second World War, tend to be very uh, anti-racist, liberal, left-wing, um, you know, wore their politics on their sleeve. It was a big thing for them. And yet, somehow couldn't abandon the idea of race. They were still clung to it. And I think that reflects what we've all done since the Second World War. We know that racism is wrong, and yet race still means something to us. We need to hang on to it socially because it has social meaning, but do, why do we still hang on to it biologically? Why do we still feel that there's something there? Thank you very much. Thank you.